Welcome, everybody. We have an amazing show for you today. Today, we are featuring two more of our incredible Exceptional Women awardees, and I can assure you that you have never spoken to the CEO of a 330-year-old company, but today you can. Her name is Nami Yamamoto, and her company is Yamamoto Yama, 330-year-old Japanese company that created edible seaweed for the world, plus they own stash tea and so much more. So we'll come to Nami in a moment. She is joined by another EWA, and that is Julia Stamberger. Julia is a serial entrepreneur and the founder of the Planting Hope Company with the most incredible plant-based snacks. I know I eat them all the time, unfortunately, and also sesame milk. So you'll hear from both of them with their delicious uh, contributions to our world of food and enjoyment. I'm Lorraine Siegel. I'm the founder, CEO, and chairman of the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation. We enable high-level women to rise to meet their dreams, just like Nami and Julia have today. Why did we start this foundation? Well, I never had a mentor. All the way through my early career as a lawyer, then a CEO of a number of uh, entrepreneurial companies, and even as a board director, I did not have a coach. And so I wanted to be sure that women who walk the road less traveled that I had would always have an advisory group of women to support and advise them for the rest of their lives. That's exactly what we do at EWA. And so let me bring on my amazing guests, Nami and Julia. Welcome to our show. I am so happy to have both of you here with many, many questions. Let me start with you, Julia. I know that you did contribute something unique, which we still enjoy today, to the airline industry. Tell us a little bit about that. I think happy to. Happy. So I have the unique... Um, uh, opportunity of bringing the airline snack box concept to the world. So that food that you eat on the plane that comes in a little box that's shelf stable, everything's individually packaged. I was brought into United Airlines in the early 2000s to help them to find new ways to solve in-flight issues and generate revenue on board. And there was a big operational issue with trying to sell fresh sandwiches and salads in flight to customers. There'd either be too much and there'd be a lot of waste left over or not enough and not everybody else would would, would get their food in flight. So the snack box concept after, uh, actually solved all of that. Um, the challenge was to create uh, the concept of a, a fresh meal, but just with shelf stable pieces. So for instance, one of the best sellers is you know hummus and olives and pita chips and nuts and fruit, all in individual single serving portions that together compose a meal. And it sounds simple today, but back then there wasn't a lot of great clean label ready to eat food in single serving packages. So it required a lot of original work to get there, but I did it for United, left United and started a company that launched those at really all the other carriers in North America. And now we have the snack box as kind of a staple of in-flight food service today. It's amazing, Julia. Amazing what you've done. And the Planting Hope Company has products which are the hummus, the black bean dip, and also, of course, the incredible chips. Tell us a little bit about how you founded that. So that company was a was was an interesting start because it came out of passion um, and mission and purpose. Uh, a number of close friends of mine had been deeply involved in the food industry for a long time. In fact, that's how I met my husband when he was the head buyer at Whole Foods and I went in to pitch him a product. So we all very much lived and breathed the industry. And because of that, we knew what was great about the industry and where there were big holes. And you know, when I say big holes, it's categories like plant milk. Uh, for instance, you think of plant milk as being something that's very healthy, uh, better for you than perhaps dairy me uh, milk, certainly more sustainable. But the biggest uh, product in that category is almond milk. And almond milk is not sustainable. In fact, it's terrible for bees. It uses a lot of water. And at the end of the day, there's less than a gram of protein per serving where you get eight grams with dairy milk. 
So we decided to start a company that filled in those holes so that consumers could get products that did actually meet their nutrition standards. Uh, things like rather than feeding your kids veggie straws, which were, although they're called veggie straws, it's really deep fried potato slurry um, with ketchup, you know, for color, you could feed them chips that actually had real peas as the number one ingredient that you could see in the chip. Wow. That's amazing. You know, if something looks organic, it looks healthy and moms pick it up for their kids and you just have no idea. I mean, half of my family drinks almond milk. And when you look at the amount of water that's used to make almond milk, water has become our scarcest commodity. Of course, in Southern California, it's a huge, huge problem, the whole of California. So that is something we're going to come back to because it's a very interesting topic and a sustainability issue for sure. But Nami, you have a story unlike any other story I've ever heard, actually. Tell us a little bit about your family member. Was it your grandfather that created edible seaweed? Sure. Uh, so my family business is called Yama Motoyama. It's family owned and operated since 1690, which is 330 years ago, if you can imagine that. And um, if you have any question about Japanese green tea or nori seaweed, you come to me and I have all the questions answered for you. Uh, green tea, imagining 300 years ago, it was actually brown and it wasn't delicious at that time. And my family discovered this magic to make this tea actually green and turn into something you can actually enjoy the flavor of it. And since then, our way of making tea became a standard of Japanese green tea and it's nowadays called sencha. So I call my family a pioneer and innovator of Japanese green tea. And we are also a largest nori CV provider. It is a black sheet of paper and wraps around sushi rolls. Um, so if you enjoy sushi at a Japanese restaurant, and um, it's more likely that you are tasting our seaweed and drinking our green tea. Amazing. And you have done a little matcha tea demonstration for our EWAs. And it was an amazing taste, like nothing I've ever tasted. Where does that matcha tea come from? Uh, that one is actually coming from Japan. Um, we source um, our tea from Japan and also Brazil. Uh, we have own tea garden in Brazil that my grandfather um, you know, um, went there and see the opportunity to grow um, something else, but Japanese green tea in Brazil. So. Yeah, we source everything um, from our own garden. We know where it's exactly coming from. That is very important for me and for the gen new generation. Uh, we are talking about millennials and next gen. Um, it's really important to be authentic and we know exactly the, where the sources um, of tea is coming from. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, you bought stash tea some time ago, right? So tell us a little bit about stash tea, Nami. Sure. Um, so stash tea and we had a relationship uh, since 80s. Um, Stash Tea was looking for the co-parking um, manufacturer and we had a machine to make. So we started co-parking for them and it was natural that we became together. So we decided to own 100% of Stash Tea and start basically you know, make all the tea bags for them. And we actually share the same mission um, between Stash and Mamotoyama, and that is we delight our consumers by one sip, one bite, one exciting experience at the time. So it just made a lot of sense for us to be together between Stash and Mamotoyama. That's amazing, that really is. Uh, there are a lot of comments coming in, so uh, you can actually put some of them up here. Uh, Mary Zupone, oh, that's so fantastic. Yes, we, we recognize some of our EWAs here. And of course, Nami and Julia are in a cohort named number seven. Though, of course, all of their cohort sisters are coming in saying hi. They're here from Vegas, from Nicole Muscondis, another cohort member, Amy Towner. Thanks for joining us. It's wonderful to see all of you here. Thank you. Um, going back to you, Julia, could you address the water issue? Because that is something that's very high on everybody's agenda right now. How does the Planting Hope Company compare with the almond milk producers, for example, and what's the differentiator there? Yeah, it's actually quite extraordinary. The amount of water that's used to produce um, a single liter of almond milk is extreme. Um, 
it, and if you compare it to oat milk, oat milk is much better than almond milk, uh, but it still uses quite a lot of water to cultivate as well as to process. Uh, we just launched a new milk called sesame milk. It's the first sesame milk worldwide. And the number one component of sesame milk is sesame seeds. In fact, it's a sesame protein that's extracted from sesame seeds when you press them for oil. So sesame is primarily an oil crop. It's grown um, in you know hot, arid regions. It's very drought resistant. And it actually uh, renews and repopulates, regenerates the soil. It actually infuses nutrients back in so it can be used used as a rotation crop with other things like cotton that are also very important. And the thing about sesame seeds is um, to get the protein out of sesame, you extract the oil from them and you upcycle the byproduct of that oil extraction um, into the core nutrients for sesame. Now, sesame is also very pest resistant. It naturally has a bitter acid around the hull, which means that you don't need a lot of pesticides or other things to farm it. And that's a, it's a crop that's been around for more than 4,000 years and used in food. We're just getting to its properties now. But if you can compare that to almond milk, sesame uses um, effectively 95% less water than almond milk and 75% less than oat milk to cultivate. Wow, those are significant numbers. I am so thrilled that you are doing what you're doing because you're definitely changing the sustainability of our food and that is incredible. Well, let's think about for a moment, uh, going back to you, Nami, one of the things I know about your background, which just blew me away, frankly, when I heard about it, is that you chose to go to college in the US. You chose a small Midwestern college. You couldn't speak English and there was nobody who could speak Japanese. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Why did you do it and how was it? Sure. Um, actually, I'm really glad that I chose a small college. I grew up in Japan until 18, until high school. And I just, I was very unique, I have to say, which is very unusual for Japanese people that I wanted to get out from Japan and this do something different. So this small college in Idaho that I choose is only 800 students, only three Japanese students at the time. And I didn't have any opportunity to speak Japanese and just immerse into US culture. And what I liked about the college was actually really intimate. So because it's a small you know, small number of students in the factory and um, the professor, the relationship between the students and professor are very intimate and you know, of, of course the students also too. And um, actually I was thinking about it and that's very similar to EWA in the sense that um, you know, we are growing number of people, but at the same time, it's still very intimate. And I see the connection that I like this organization that um, makes us very unique and intimate and have a really close relationship so that we pay attention to each other. That's amazing, Nami. And I also heard that you were a good salsa dancer. Is that right? <laughs> um, used to be. <laughs> Well, we'll have to bring some salsa into some of our EWA activities because we want to see you dance, which is great. So uh, I want to go back to you, Julia, because you have, oh, hi there, Sh Shruti. Thanks for joining us. Um, Julia, you have a very unusual board of directors. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> Well, it's unusual, um, but hopefully uh, not forever. Um, we put together one of the first all women boards of directors and we are actually filing to go public now um, and among public companies that will be very unique. Um, so yeah, so we, we have some very high powered and uh, extremely successful women who have agreed to join our board. And even though we're a small and fast growing company, we're all aligned on some common missions. Our focus is you know, clearly nutrition and sustainability but also representation and making sure that you know women are well represented at the top ranks of companies that we partner with as many women run organizations as possible and do everything that we can to make sure that uh, women's voices and diverse voices are heard uh, both because we have that opportunity and it's very meaningful to me and the women that we're involved with in fact our whole c-suite is all women even though my co-founders were men um, and we also see a strong need for diversity in using our voices to be able to do that because at the end of the day 90 percent of the consumers who adopt our pro products are women and you know this makes sense to align with them as well as from a mission standpoint 
It makes me so excited to hear you say that, Julia, because your company, Planting Hope Company, is a company for the future. It's really a role model for other companies, hopefully. And as soon as you are public, I will be buying stock in your company. So very excited about that. So going back to, to you, Nami, for a moment, uh, is the consumption of sushi and Japanese food increasing in the United States? What's your experience in that? It is. It's. I don't have the big number uh, in my head, but compared to, for example, Chinese or Korean food industry, Japanese restaurants are increasing incredible amount. And that's how we grow our business as well. That more Japanese restaurants in new neighborhood, that means it's more products, our products are in those restaurants. So it's, it's um, I think you feel it. You feel that um, amount of Japanese restaurants increasing and the variety and the diversity of Japanese food is increasing. Not um, Sushi is not the only food that you enjoy in Japan. There is so many kind of um, Japanese food out there that's so delicious and speaks to our culture, uh, not just sushi. Uh, so I see that I'm really enjoying um, being in Los Angeles, actually, because I get to see that those diversity and variety of food that I enjoy in Japan is actually here, which is very amazing. Yes, it is terrific. And so uh, both of you are moms of amazing children. I know because I've seen their pictures and, and met some of them. And I would love to know a little bit about that because uh, Nami in particular, you have a girl and a boy. And I know that you are the first female CEO of Yamamoto Yama because you are an only child. And uh, so you needed to become CEO in order to continue the family legacy. What are your plans about your son and your daughter in terms of that legacy? So I get the question all the time. Um, I do. I am an only one child um, in my family, and that means I am the one taking care of the business. Uh, I do have a little pressure. At the same time, I made my um, passion, um, let's say, um, Actually, my passion is the challenges I have. So somehow I converted this pressure into the challenges that I enjoy uh, to overcome this pressure. And only way we can do that is looking at your parents, look for, for my children, looking at me. Um, I enjoy these challenges and they want, they are looking at me and I want to be like mom um, and joining these challenges and join this path. And I want to be the one leading the company. So I, I'm not going to put any pressure on my children. Uh, they are still two and three. They are running around <laughs> in my background. Uh, but hopefully they see me and joining uh, my, my way and they want to be the one. I love that. I love that. And Julia, you have small ones as well. So what are your thoughts about your children perhaps coming into your businesses or becoming entrepreneurs like you? Well, my children have thoughts about being part of the business. <laughs> Milo, age eight, is talking about taking over uh, someday and uh, also all of the ideas that they can bring mm -hmm. to the table. It's interesting, you know, they're still very young. They're two, seven and eight. Um, but I, they, they often kind of come and want to be with me while I'm working or on calls and the rest, um, especially with some of the time they've been home during COVID. And I'm trying to introduce the concept to them of the things that we do and why we're doing it uh, to teach, you know, my daughter about why it's important to have women's leadership, to teach my son that it's important to look at women as leaders. Um, and he's, you know, he's he's seeing that he's becoming a part of it. But I think it's interesting to have kind of a children involved in a family business because it makes it very personal. When he sees, you know, our chips, you know, there there are chips. And, you know, he was involved in uh in in trying them. You know, when my son sees our sesame milk, uh, he remembers that he came to an early testing and we had all of the little vials you know set out on the table at our development shop and he looked at them and he looked up at me and he's like before I try these you do have the antidotes don't you <laughs> <laughs> in case you were going to poison your children right, right? <laughs> I love the sophistication of that one I got to give him a hug next time I see him well that is that's very interesting you know we have a couple of questions and by the way to our audience please put your questions in we'd love to answer them and if we don't get to all of them 
post them on LinkedIn and we'll come back and answer them afterwards. But there is one question, uh, which is from Jennifer from Tulsa. And Nami, this is one I was going to ask you. So I'm glad, Jennifer, that you asked it. Thank you. How will you manage the gender challenges when you return, if you return, to live in Japan one day after being here in the USA? What do you think, Nami? You know, everyone knows that in Japan's performance on women in, in executives are pretty <laughs> awful. And um, I would say I'm very lucky to be in a family business where I can get the best support from my colleagues and you know, being a female leader because um, it's it's a little different compared to someone in Japan and um, from the scratch and going up to the women executive but by themselves. It's very, very hard. And Japan is still a male-dominated country, then we simply need more women uh, who tell us wonderful stories to be a female business owners and educate everyone how to support the female leaders. Um, you know, we we need to remove, um, we need to work harder to remove the perception that you know mom is a primary care for a child because a lot of people have that. And both, in my view, both parents are primary care. For the child and we are doing we are doing parenting together and i just hope to be one of them you know educating and influencing those future female leaders um you know including and you know i enjoy the challenges between me my you know mom leader and the wife and being a woman well, you know what, Nami, I know we're going to hear a lot more from you when you uh, are living maybe in Japan one day because you are going to change the world and the world of Japanese women. I'm so grateful to you even for thinking that way. Uh, there are a couple other questions. Let's see one of them. Our producer just put up one from Albert from Boise in Idaho. Thanks, Albert. Um, Julia, how have you risen above the noise in the healthy food arena? And by the way, he likes your products and it's the barbecue ones he likes. I have to tell you, Albert, that's my favorite too. Julia. Well, Albert, um, you know, having been in this industry for a long time, it's not having the best tasting product that succeeds. It's the tactical execution to get yourself on the shelf and then to get off the shelf. So when we design products, it's not only with the consumer and the taste in mind, but it's in, with the retailer. How do we fit into their assortment? How, does it, how do we make sense for them to carve out the space to put us on the shelf and to take a chance? And we do that across all of our products. So the calculus is really, where is there a unique opportunity that's not filled, um, that's in a category that has high velocity, good turns, a good approach to market. There are some categories that are just very, very challenging. Uh, take the world of barbecue sauce, for instance. People do not use it very frequently. They don't buy it very frequently. We want to be in something where we're a pantry staple and people uh, use our product every day uh, because that's you know, how you start getting the velocity and the turns. Right now with the COVID environment, the ways that you get in front of consumers Consumers are changing dramatically. And so we're looking at more unusual ways to get in front of folks where you can actually sample the products and get them interested to the, in them, but also teach them where to go to the store to buy the products. Because, you know, just building demos or doing chip stacks or things in grocery stores, you know, don't work if everybody's, you know, searching online and buying on Instacart, and not actually going into the store. So we're going back to things like, you know, airline distribution, for instance, back to that, where we're, you know, getting uh, people while they're in seats and they don't have other things to do or ways that make it worth their while to actually go into the store and find us on the shelf. It can really be a challenge with things like sesame milk where we launched it initially in a shelf stable product and we have to tell people no it's not in the refrigerated case you've got to go to another place in the store. So you know how do you succeed? It's about tactical execution of serving both the retailer and getting in front of the consumer with something that makes sense. That's how you get them to try it once and yeah. then it has to taste really good. Um, uh, for them to come back and buy it again. Yeah, it's it's a very tough distribution challenge, but you know something? If anybody can do it, you can. I think there's a question from Sally, and let's put that up. Sally, thanks, Sally. Nice to see you. The new C-suite role is a chief sustainability officer. Is that something you were thinking of, Julia? It's a good idea, uh, for sure. I, you know, As we start to grow and scale, it's something that right now we're making it part of the chief operations officer's role uh, formally. Um, and then when we're at the right size to be able to add a formal full-time role, it's certainly something that 
we want to bring in, and here's the perspective. Um, some of the sustainability challenges that you know we're bringing to the forefront are with crops like sesame, where they don't have um, industry bodies or a lot of organization or even a lot of published information about the health benefits that kind of been under the radar. So we need to not only continue pushing the envelope on sustainability and sustainable packaging, but also on a kind of organizing our supply chain around sustainability that'll be scaled for the long term and really has an opportunity to impact the food supply on a larger basis. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a, a sustainability and supply chain are integrally are. connected and that's a whole nother discussion. Um, there's a wonderful question that just came in for NAMI, so let's put that one up. Uh, NAMI Marina from San Diego wants to know, oh, wh what's the story behind making seaweed into an edible product? It looks rather slimy when you see it in the ocean. So how did that idea come about, Nami? Oh, sure. Um, so seaweed was actually not commercialized until maybe like a hundred years ago. And my grandfather and his neighbor got together and went, you know, found a way to actually commercialize it and kind of farm raise it in the ocean. Uh, so again, seaweed wasn't edible uh, back in the days. It was like a wakame seaweed back in the days. Still, we have it there. Um, but we made a way, same as making paper. Do you know how to, have you anyone seen pa making paper before in a traditional way? Uh, that's the way we make seaweed. Um, same as, exactly same as paper. And we actually eat <laughs> the seaweed paper in this sense, but, um, Basically, um, it was um, farm raised. We found a way to farm raise it and make the way to, um, you know, the form of paper so that we can wrap the uh, rice around it so we, um, to serve at a sushi restaurant. Does no, 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 no. My, my grandchildren love the stuff. So uh, it's, it's a marvelous thing. And I would love one day to see how that's actually made. It's a slimy to paper kind of interesting idea. Um, I want to go back to you, Julia, for a moment and talk about raising capital, because I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs who are watching, and that is always a huge issue. Uh, so you are using the Canadian Stock Exchange as a technique for raising capital. Why? Yeah, so I've raised capital for to support businesses from private markets uh, for more than 20 years. Um, a lot of that from individual investors, but also family offices, uh, venture capital funds, um, and other items. And it IPO, a public market opportunity for a smaller company, was never really an opportunity that was on the radar previously. You typically think of, okay, when you're at $100 million in sales, then maybe go list on the NASDAQ, but certainly not before that. Um, that's changed in recent years with some evolution of some smaller exchanges. And there's one in Canada called the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture Exchange that's specifically geared around fundraising for smaller businesses and makes that possible. Oh, very interesting. Well, maybe you will have some questions on LinkedIn from some of our viewers about that. Um, I certainly would like to know more about it because that is one of the biggest challenges for startup companies. And we have a number of entrepreneurs in EWA, so it's always an issue. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask Nami before we close, because we're running out of time, we just have a few more minutes left, is what would be the normal approach to a Japanese woman who is powerful in the Japanese culture, would she be sabotaged, sidelined, ignored? How, how would that happen? Um, are you asking the question that if I'm the Japanese, normal Japanese person in Japan, like how do they feel the challenges yes. being a woman? Yes, yes, I am. Yes. Sure. Um, there is not much role model, I have to say. In Japan, that all the governments are all male, uh, few females, and there's not much role model. So I think it's even hard for women to dream about being women executives. And we just don't have enough support for that. Even the educational, the education system is not there to support the women and the child care. Uh, so the government, in my opinion, government needs to step up. Um, we cannot even, <laughs> it's, it's hard to say, we cannot even dream about being women in executives unless you have a resources to do so. Like my case, that my, I, have my, I have my family support um, to, um, ha, you know, to be a woman in executive. Otherwise, um, if I'm the regular person, it's very hard for me to even dream about it. And you just got to go 
um, as it is. Um, well, you know what, Nami, maybe we need to extend and expand EWA to Japan to uh, because we help high level women to dream and maybe we need to help more women to dream to become to high level. Well, there's certainly a big challenge in that. Ladies, I really don't want to end the show because there's so much more that we have to ask you. But unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank both of you so much for joining us and sharing your insights. And hopefully, we'll have you back with us another time. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you. Thanks, Nami and uh, Julia. But our next show is going to be amazing as well. We have another two EWAs. Have you had a Binax antigen test yet? Well, if you have, the general manager and executive leader of Abbott's premier US workplace and drug testing occupational health business at Abbott is going to join us. Kathy Ross, she has so much to tell us. We're so grateful to her and her company for what they've done to help us test for COVID during this very difficult time. And with her, we have Nicole Muscondis. Nicole is the co-CEO of Nicholas and Company a multi-generation major Midwestern food distributor. And Nicole has so much to tell us about supply chains. So does Kathy. We will learn about labor shortages and what both companies are doing to solve these very critical and timely issues. So please join us for our next show. It's on Monday, November the 1st. It's going to be at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, and I hope you will be with us. I want to leave you with a question today, which of course has to do with seaweed. Do you eat seaweed as a snack? And if you do, please email me and let me know. We'd love to hear more about it. And I'm sure Nami would enjoy those answers. We also want to make sure that you post on LinkedIn, share our show, and of course, go to our YouTube channel. We're also on Amazon Music. We're on Spotify. We're going to become a podcast, and you can come back and listen to all aspects of the show whenever you wish to. It has been such a pleasure to be with you today. I look forward to seeing you on our next show. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week.